Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning. I have one quick announcement to make before we um, begin. And uh, as many of you probably realize, the deacons are working very hard to make sure that the things that we're doing in the church, you know, as far as we can in terms of protocol and cleaning things up. And uh, they've asked me to see if there are other people in the church who are willing to kind of help them. So um, if you're willing to kind of help, kind of set the service up for the, you know, after the early service, we set up obviously for the 11 o'clock. It takes a little effort. After 11 o'clock, um, you know, if you're going to stay in here for the Q&A time, um, uh, fine. Uh, but we all, we're asking that if you have a question to either write it down or email it even from your phone. But uh, if you're not, to kind of, you know, uh, have social time outside as you exit through um, that door right there so that all the things necessary to move to the next thing kind of happen rapidly. Does that make does that, doesn't sound overly harsh? Just get out of here when you're done. Um, our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 2. It is a very, very powerful psalm if you read Psalm 2 in terms of you know, um, the, uh, the lordship of Christ over the nations and, and what have you. But there's a, a portion in here that is a little confusing, at least if, if you just read it like at first blush. Because we read, you know, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. He's talking about Jesus. And yet Jesus is not created. He's not a created thing. But I mean, you know, like when you think of begotten, you think of a birth. And uh, the Bible kind of teaches what that means, that Jesus was, was begotten, not made. Right? He's begotten, not made. Like he's the firstborn. It's a position of preeminence, not a, not a position of non-existence and then existence. But here it's even different because we're going to go through Acts today, rapidly try to get all through Acts. But what you see is you see a quotation in Acts of Psalm 2, verses 7 and 8, where this idea that today I have begotten you is referring to the resurrection, which we'll see is really a central message in Acts, is this idea that God raised Jesus from the dead. And so we see this idea of a resurrection in a passage in the Old Testament that talks really about the worldwide expansion of the kingdom of God. So with that in mind, let's just take a moment and settle our our minds and hearts as we prepare for worship. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Thus far, the reading of God's word, let us pray. Father in heaven, it really has become quite apparent to us as we observe the way this world is functioning, how desperately it needs to be possessed by Jesus, owned by and governed and redeemed by Jesus. What a wonderful pronouncement that Jesus is granted the ends of the earth as his possession. What a glorious message for the earth to hear this, that we are not left in darkness and sin and death, but there is a deliverer who has defeated our greatest enemies, sin and death. 
as we enter into, Father, a time of, of worship, even before we open our mouths to sing, let us take rank with Isaiah, who beholding the glory of God said nothing until his, his lips were touched and his sin was purged. Father, toward that end, may we recognize our own sinful estate before a holy God and take some time to confess our sin and our need for redemption that we might also hear those wonderful words of pardon uttered by our Savior. Your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. And then may we respond robustly, praising your holy name. So here now, Father, from heaven, just at where we sit, as we confess to you our sins and our need for a Savior. Help us, Father, to begin to grasp what it means to stand before the consuming fire of a God, and yet not be consumed. Help us to appreciate the fact that you, you tell us that you, in, you inhabit the praises of your people, that you are very much here with us as a father, as a king, as a priest and prophet. And we do pray, Father, that this would comfort our souls and cultivate our minds and hearts in such a way that we would seek to follow you in a manner worthy of that calling. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And my friends, if it is true of you that by the grace of God, God has, has opened your eyes to some level to, to apprehend and understand your own sinfulness before a holy God, if God has done that for you and in you and opened your eyes to the truth of Christ, Christ crucified and risen, and you call upon his name, then I do. I declare to you what the scriptures declare, words that have come from the lips of our Savior, and that is your faith has saved you, your sins are washed away. This morning's reading is the Apostles' Creed, which is shown on the screens behind me. Please join me in reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Ever giving God, source of all goodness and charity, your ear is always open to our needs. You are faithful and provide for us. With joy we bring our thanksgiving. For all your mercies, we return to you from our abundance. All that we give, we dedicate to your glory. All that we keep, we commit to your care. For we are only stewards of your bounty. Bless what we give and what we keep. For all is your creation. Amen. I would like uh, the Reeves family. Not, not you guys, I'm not you. This Reeves family to come stand before the congregation. How many generations of Reeves do we have in the room? Four generations of Reeves in the room. How wonderful is that? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I would try to do that, but I think I'd pull a hand, pull a hamstring. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We believe that children are included in God's covenant and are members of this household, this visible church. Baptism assumes that we and our children are conceived and born in sin and need cleansing. Water signifying this cleansing by the blood and spirit of Christ. In our baptism, the Lord puts his name on us, claims us as his own, and summons us to assume the obligations of the covenant. In baptism, God calls us to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, to renounce the devil, the world, and the flesh, and to walk humbly with our God. It has always been God's very gracious command that the sacrament signifying inclusion in the covenant of grace be applied not only to those who profess the faith, but to their children as well. And this morning, I wish to present before the congregation Logan Scott Reeves, child of God's covenant, to be baptized. Dane and Cassidy, do you desire that Logan be baptized? Yes. By the grace of God, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child, seeking to raise Logan in the instruction and admonition of the Lord? Yes. Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Logan by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging Logan to know and follow Christ and be a faithful member of Christ's church. If so, say, we do. We do. Amen. Baptism is a sign and a seal of God's covenant promise to his church. It is a covenant in which God gives life, guards from evil, and nurtures in love. Come on over this way. 
Yeah. Hey, bud. Logan Scott Reeves, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, truly, children are a blessing. And we thank you for Logan. And we do pray that even now in his little heart, your spirit would dwell, that you would guide him all the days of his life, that he would be wise and good and faithful. And we do pray, Father, that many years from now, you would bring him safely into eternity through the blood of the covenant, through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a little time now and uh, pray together as a church. So, uh, so please join me. Father in heaven, we do pray that um, we would recognize what a beautiful thing it is that you've called us to bring our petitions to you, that, you're, that you would include us in what you're doing and that you want to know and hear from our very lips our needs, our wants, our praises. So, Father, we do thank you for this gift of prayer, and we pray that we would make good use of it for the advancement of your kingdom, for the nurturing of your people. And we thank, Father, first and foremost, the Jenkins family. We think of Diana and John at the loss of Nancy yesterday. We pray, Father, that uh, you would comfort them, with the true comfort of the knowledge that Nancy has, uh, is now outside of all suffering and now no longer looks through a mirror dimly but knows the full force of what it means to be loved by God, to be in your grace and mercy. We just thank you for the time we had with her and we do pray, Father, that you would continue to bring your comfort to those who love her. We also pray for this whole uh, pandemic that's going on. We do thank you that uh, even in the confusion, it seems like the, uh, the death rates are going down. We do pray that would continue to be the trend. We pray that you would help us as a world, as a country, as a community, as a church to make good and right decisions in terms of how to navigate through these very troubling waters. We pray, Father, also for the... Um, it's like the collateral damage of the way this is being cured. We think of unemployment and financial struggles and depression and anxiety and uh, self-destructive behavior and overdoses and domestic violence and all these things that seem to be the, um, the fruit of this isolation, which is such an unnatural thing. So we do pray that you would strengthen people as they seek to be faithful and yet find themselves in situations that uh, make it difficult to walk in the way that we should walk. We pray, Father, for um, our brothers and sisters throughout the world who experience on a regular basis so much more in terms of persecution and difficulty than any of us experience even through this pandemic. Those who for just naming the name of Christ, even to this day, I mean, statistically, Father, we're told more than ever are those who call upon your name being put to death. So we pray that you would grant them perseverance, boldness. We pray for their persecutors, that you would convert them, that you would shine the light of Christ in their hearts or remove them from their positions of oppressive power. We lift up to you the hops who are working in a very difficult place as far as this world is concerned, Haiti, to advance the kingdom of God, trying to train leadership. We do pray, Father, that you would begin to shine a bright light in that part of the world. We lift up to you, Father, Jessica Sprague and Kara Thibo and Rachel Pollard, all who are with child. We pray that uh, there would be no complications in their pregnancies and that they would bring forth healthy covenant babies. We pray and continue to pray for Alan Hill's mother, Patricia, 
who fell and broke her hip. We pray also for Lisa Curran's mom, Lee, who also fell. Pray for extra strength and patience and perseverance for Lisa. She seeks to love and honor her mom. We lift up to you James Howard's mom and her illness and difficulties, and we praise you that Bonnie Coronado and her liver transplant seems to be doing well, and we do pray for continued strength for her. We pray for Calvin and Michelle, especially Michelle Kalbeck, as she seeks to minister to her dad, who has Parkinson's disease. Help them to be able to love uh, the father of their family, and that you would just shine your love and light in his heart. We pray for Jerry Ortiz's mom, who's battling dementia, and his uncle, who's recovering from a stroke. We also pray for Deb Allison's mom, Rosie, who's battling Alzheimer's, and Tiffany Rodriguez's mother, Carolyn, who's battling Alzheimer's, and our dear brother, John Featherstone, who's battling Alzheimer's. We think of Linda Peruca's mother, Lee, who's battling dementia. You know, all these, it's heartbreaking to see this type of thing take place. So we do pray, Father, that even those whose minds aren't really working as clear as they have in the past, that by your Spirit you would reach down into their hearts and work in a way that maybe we can't even see, giving them the comfort and the peace of the victory of Jesus. We also pray for Karen Clay, Linda's sister, as she battles cancer, and we Pray for Rex Monson as he is in a really tough battle. We lift up to you Tracy Taylor, a longtime member of our church, who's being evaluated on Thursday for eye surgery. Um, he's been declared legally blind, and we just pray that he would be evaluated and treated, and you would grant him his sight. And we continue to pray for Andy, who's grieving the loss of Kat's mom. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, just to bring you up to date, we are in a series called Route 66, starting with Genesis, going all the way through Revelation, and uh, based upon what we might call the theme verse of John 5.39, where Jesus basically says the whole Bible is about him. And we went through the Old Testament and saw in foreshadows and types and what have you, Christ in the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. So we went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Now we're looking at Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, I'm using, as kind of a springboard, a verse that's not actually in Acts. It's in John, but it is, it is in John anticipating what's about to happen, where we see Acts kind of taking over from Luke's gospel. So it's found in John 16, verse 7. Hear now the word of God. This is Jesus speaking. Nevertheless, I tell you, It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it seems um, so counterintuitive to hear Jesus say that it would be to our advantage, or at least speaking to the apostles, to their advantage, that he would go away. It's almost as if we, we so desire the presence of Christ, how could this be? So we do pray that as we examine what that means, certainly the words of Christ ring true, that it is in the best interest of the church that he would ascend and send his spirit. So we pray that you would teach these things to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many of you know I uh, moved my oldest daughter to Dallas, my wife and I. uh, You know, she's working at a hospital there in uh, Parkland Hospital in in Dallas. And while we were there, we were in the company of a young man who seemed to know a lot about the Kennedy assassination. Now, I'm one of the people who's old enough 
to remember where I was when Kennedy was shot, and I've seen um, movies, and I've read books, and articles, and documentaries all about, you know, the Kennedy assassination back in 1963. But I've never actually been, even though I'd been to Dallas, I'd never actually been to where all this stuff happened. So we parked at the book depository. Now, those of you who are old enough, the moment you hear book depository, there must be a thousand book depositories or more in this country, but that word, book depository, there's only one. It's in Dallas. Or the grassy knoll. How many grassy knolls are there? There's a grassy knoll outside, but there's only one grassy knoll. So you're there, and you're looking at the book depository, and this young man says, that's the window where the fatal shot was took. And then, and then he goes, and these marks on the street, th this is where it happened. And then we're standing on this grass, this little patch of grass. And I'm like, well, where's the grassy knoll? He's like, you're standing on the grassy knoll. I'm like, I thought it would be bigger than this. I mean, I'm looking at this, and I, I found it fascinating. But in reality, I was looking at a building, a street, and a patch of grass. But I was enthralled. A similar thing happened when my wife and I were in Europe, and we weren't you know, you go to Europe and you go to cathedrals and chapels and churches, and they're all amazing and beautiful. But we went into one that was John Calvin's church. And um, I look at his pulpit. Now, just so you understand the background here, I have probably read John Calvin's opinion on every verse I have ever preached on in 30 years. And so I, I feel like I kind of know him, even though he died, you know, 400 years ago or whatever. I feel like I kind of know him. I know about his ministry. I know about his life. I know about his theology. And we're in this church, and it wasn't the nicest church. But was, they're all nice, but I just, I just sat there and looked at his pulpit. And my wife will tell you, it was kind of an emotional experience for me. And not because it was so well made. It was because there was like, history in my mind of this event. Well, why do I bring these things up as we kind of go through Acts? Well, what we've done, we've spent four sermons going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talking about, even though how the entire message of redemption is found in each of those Gospels, there's special emphasis that each of the Gospel writers has. And now, we're going to move on in the future, starting next week, we're going to look at letters written to churches, they call them epistles, in case you don't know, when, when you're, for the most part, if you're reading a book in the New Testament, you're reading somebody else's mail, right? and that's why it's kind of hard, because you've got to figure out, what are they writing about here, because you've really intercepted somebody's mail, a letter to a church or an individual, but Acts, Acts is different, it's really different than the four Gospels, it's different than the following epistles. It's, it's written by Luke to an individual, Theophilus, but, but it's not as if he's giving Theophilus instructions on how to minister in the church, when, as when he wrote to, when Paul wrote to Timothy. Remember, Paul wrote to Timothy, and he's going like, here's how you pick elders, here's what the church service should look like, here's, so you get instruction there. But that's not, what, that's not what's happening here in Acts. Acts is kind of a historical account. It's a narrative. It's, a, it's kind of a part two of Luke. And it forms kind of a bridge between the Gospels and the other New Testament epistles. Now, the reason I open with this idea of places that had an effect, what you see in Acts, because I, I have probably read Ephesians a hundred times. But what you see in Acts is how that church got started. You know, I've read First and Second Corinthians. I can't tell you many times. But what you look at when you read Acts is you're like, oh, that's how that church got started. So you see in Acts kind of this beginning, this historical notation of how these churches got started. And then once you start reading First and Second Corinthians and Romans and Galatians and Philippians and Colossians, you kind of have a little bit of the history in the back of your mind. So we have this going on in Acts, and Acts covers about a 30-year period after the ascension of Christ. So Christ, he, he dies, he's resurrected, he ascends, and now we've got this early church going on. And Acts begins with the ascension. 
So you have Jesus ascending and, and the, his followers kind of looking up and they're told he's going to come back the same way he left, going to end the flesh. This, there's, there will be a second coming. So it starts with that, but then almost immediately Acts goes to this place that has become a source of confusion and controversy for the church since day one for the last 2,000 years, but especially in the last about 120 years. Why? Because here's, what's, here's kind of what Jesus, Jesus is resurrected. He spends 40 days with people, and then he ascends. But before he ascends, he goes, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, and it'll be 10 days. So we have 50 days total. In 10 days, I'm going to send my spirit. In 10 days, I'm going to baptize the church with the Holy Spirit. There's going to be this spirit baptism take place. And so, so now we go into chapter 2, and there is this event. It's called Pentecost, or the, the Feast of the Harvest, or the Feast of Weeks. It's a Jewish festival where it, the Bible says Jewish people from every nation under heaven are there, and they, they don't all speak the same language. So you got this event, this like church service. And wild things take place. The, the rushing wind, it says, goes through them. So you've got this rushing wind, and then you've got these, these tongues as of fire that go on top of everybody's head, right? So imagine, the wind starts blowing, and you're in this room, and there's these tongues of fire, and they, every one of you got your own tongue on your head of fire. And then there's this supernatural ability that people have to speak a foreign language, so that everybody who's there from all these different nations actually understands what's being said. It's like the opposite of the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel, they were like, we're going to build a tower to heaven, and God's like, I'm going to confuse your language so you can't even talk to each other. And here it's just the opposite. Everybody's confused in their language, but, but the Lord makes it very clear what the actual message is, the means by which heaven is actually obtained. So here's the question. Is this idea of rushing wind, tongues of fire, speaking a foreign language supernaturally, is that the reasonable biblical expectation for the church moving on into history? I mean, should, should we sit here and wait until the wind starts? Or should we expect tongues of fire? Most people are kind of well known to those two things, but the ability to speak in tongues, that kind of... You know, I mentioned how in the last 120 years, because in 1906 in Azusa, there was an event that took place where tongues was kind of like reintroduced to the church, and now it's a matter of controversy. Now, let me just say this. It's, it's tricky, and I would hope that wherever you are on this issue, and I'm definitely, a play, I'm definitely on a side on this issue, I would hope, though, that you would, uh, that you would interact charitably with people with whom you disagree and not be mean-spirited about it or snarky or ridicule them or, you know, in a mean-spirited way. We are to speak the truth in love. But here's something, you know, so, so put that always as to, like floating around your heart and mind. But here's something I think is important before we try to answer that question. And that is making a distinction between what they call, you know, theologians have these terms, they like the accomplished work of redemption and the applied work of redemption. The accomplished work and applied work. So the accomplished work of redemption would be the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the, the death of Jesus, the, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus. Everybody pretty much agrees all that is part of the accomplished work of redemption. Not something that will continue. It's done. It is finished, to use the words of Jesus. So let me ask you this question. After the ascending, and he says, I'm going to pour my spirit upon you. Is that part of the accomplished work of redemption? Or is that part of the applied work of redemption? Now, you're not going, cool, well, what's the applied work of redemption? The applied work of redemption is the work of the Holy Spirit opening your eyes to the truth of the accomplished work of redemption. The applied work of redemption has happened to everybody in this room who's, in fact, called upon the name of Christ. But where... 
where does the pouring out of the Spirit fit? Is that part of the applied work of redemption that we should expect to happen throughout the history of the church? Or is that part of those single past redemptive works that we should not expect to continue to happen? We don't expect Jesus to resurrect again. We don't expect him to ascend again. We certainly don't expect him to be born again and all that. But what about this? Okay, I'm not going to answer that right now. But I can tell by your faces you're interested. So let's do a quick survey of Acts, and this is going to be tough because it's fairly long, and I'm going to try to hit my boundary here to the best of my ability. So we're going to go through a lot of stuff real quick to get a feel of what this 30 years, this like first generation, if you will, of the New Covenant Church looked like. First, we started with this idea that Jesus is saying, it is better for you if I go away. Now, I've had people say that to me, but I think it had a different feel to it. So what, why? It's because now the ministry of Christ is not constrained to his physical body. He would ascend and send his spirit, and his spirit would not only extend throughout the world, but it would extend throughout history. So that act of Christ is continuing to foster the growth of his kingdom. I explained earlier, you know, this idea that he, uh, he was resurrected, 40 days, he walked around and he demonstrated through infallible proofs who he was and what he did, and then they wait in Jerusalem for 10 days, they tarry, some of your versions will say, tarry in Jerusalem, and there's going to be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And again, controversial, difficult passage. Now, there is general agreement, and I always like it when I find agreement with people of the faith. There is general agreement that the theme or thesis of Acts is found in chapter 1, verse 8, which reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. <clears throat> so we actually see this happen through Acts. We see the ministry in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then really to the uttermost ends of the Mediterranean world, which in their minds, by the way, would have been the whole world. But it also extends now to the entire globe. Now that baptism we talked about, okay, that now happens in chapter 2. And you can imagine, tongues of fire, rushing wind, people speaking foreign languages. The observers looked at that and made fun of them. They mocked them. They're like, they're, they've been drinking wine. And Peter's like, oh, no, it's too early for wine. That's not wine. Peter begins to explain to them, no, I'll tell you what's happening here. This is what was prophesied by Joel in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, he uses what they call the near demonstrative, demonstrative this, not that, but this, is what was prophesied by Joel. And he begins to kind of explain how Joel in the Old Testament was going to talk about how the Old Covenant would end and how the New Covenant would begin. And there would be cataclysmic things, like um, the sun turning black and the moon turning to blood and all of these things. He's, Peter's basically saying, we are at that place in history, if I could put it this way, where, where B.C. is becoming A.D., right? It's the turning of the ages. The new covenant has begun. And these are the signs that the Old Testament said would happen when the new covenant would begin. And then Peter preaches this great sermon. And the response to this sermon... <clears throat> is a response that I think every pastor would like to see uh, in his congregation. It says the people, after Peter gives this sermon, the people were cut to the heart. Um, later on in Acts, by the way, that phrase will be used in a negative way. They were cut to the heart and picked up stones to kill them. Okay, I would prefer that you have the first way here and not the second way. But this idea that they were affected by the preaching 
of Peter. So after he preached, they said, what should we do? Like, what's the application of this sermon? And Peter says this in verse uh, 38 and 39 of chapter 2. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is again. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. And so that's the message. Repent and be baptized for the promise. And he's referring back to that promise made to Abraham that through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And now we see the church begin to grow. In fact, just after that, we read this. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is what a church looks like. This is what the church does. They dedicate themselves to the the, the word of God, to the Lord's Supper, to fellowship, to prayer. And then I don't have it in the notes, but what you see there is that that it is there that the Lord begins to add thousands. And it's really interesting the way this reads, because it says, and, and, and they found favor with the people, and then the Lord added to their number. So it's, you're like, well, what does that mean? So what you had was you had these people kind of on the outside looking at the church function as a church, and through that observation... God was changing hearts and bringing them in to the body of Christ. See, what that tells me as a pastor, as an elder, is the church shouldn't be half world and half church. It should be the church functioning as the church. And then when the world looks at it, by the grace of God, and if his, and if his spirit touches their heart, they'll be like, that's where I belong. This is the truth. So the church must maintain an unadulterated purity in order for it to be that place where people will find that redemption. Well, it is here that Peter and John start getting in trouble because this is causing no small stir among the people. When the Christian faith came in, there was disruption. Uh, It was not only disruption religiously, it affected people's commerce, people selling idols and what have you, but the religious leaders at this point said, you guys need to stop. You guys, they say it this way, you're turning the world upside down. Like one of my seminary professors used to like to say, no, they're actually turning the world right side up, but of course, you don't want to correct the scriptures, but you get the idea. So they're saying, you need to quit preaching. And that's where we see, both in chapters 4 and chapter 5, a, um, something that we've been wrestling with a lot recently based upon, you know, orders by the government. And this is not always an easy thing to do. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. I mean, there's an obvious answer to that question, right? They were legitimate authority figures established by God, but their mandates, their orders, their legislation so contravened and contradicted the word of God that Peter's like, we can't obey you, we have to obey God. And he says that again in chapter 5. We must obey God rather than men. So whenever there is an actual conflict between a legitimate authority figure and the word of God, the word of God must prevail. Let me tell you, it's not always easy to figure that out. You know, I don't want my kids to even know this. Right? Well, Dad, I'm not sure if uh, 9 o'clock is a godly time to go to bed. <laughs> Show me the verse, Dad. You know? So it's not always easy to figure out, but it's a principle in there. Well, as the church grows, the persecution becomes intense. Um, they, they ask for prayer, for boldness. The, uh, apparently, the Holy Spirit will not suffer deceit within the church. We have this very intense event with Ananias and Sapphira where they lie to the Holy Spirit, and they both are, are, are killed. I mean, we also have conflict. Imagine that, conflict within the church. You know, they're arguing about who should be doing what jobs, and we see here that 
what many people will argue, the beginning of this idea of the deacons, a diaconate. And so they, they are like the elders are kind of, the apostles are going, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and to the word. So we need, but we need people who are going to serve tables, but they need to be men filled with the Holy Spirit. They can't just be anybody. To serve God requires a certain level of maturity. So they pick, you know, men filled with the Holy Spirit. And among those men is a man named Stephen who becomes the first New Covenant public martyr. You know, Stephen um, gives a beautiful sermon. And by all indications, was a beautiful person, just inside and out. But his sermon was something. I mean, he basically is giving a sermon to an audience of religious people, telling them their own history, and then explaining to them at the end of his sermon that they're the bad guys in their own history. And it ends with this little phrase. He addresses his listeners as those, quote, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Well, you got a Bible on your shelf. Good for you. I mean, it makes me think of the times I've had Bibles on my shelf and I'm wondering, when was the last time I cracked that thing open? This is a message for the church, our church, all churches, that the scriptures can't become some kind of religious fashion accessory. And that's what Stephen was saying it was to them. Oh, you have it, but you don't know it, you don't read it, you don't obey it, it's not even part of your life, and it is there that they picked up stones to kill him. And now what we have here, because in the first half of Acts, the central character is Peter. But it's right around the uh, martyring of Stephen that we see a new character introduced. And his name is Saul of Tarsus. And many of you know who that actually will become. Saul of Tarsus will become the Apostle Paul. And he's there consenting to the death of this beautiful Christian man. It says that he, he basically was going, I'll hold your coats while you guys stone him to death. And I don't know for sure. I really don't know for sure. But we have to realize the Apostle Paul was just a man. I mean, he was the Apostle. When he spoke, it was the Word of God. But he was a flesh and blood person. And I, don't have, I have little doubt in my mind that all the days of his life, it bothered him that he participated in the martyring of such a beautiful person. I, I can't imagine that wasn't somewhere in his mind when he referred to himself as wretched or the chief of sinners or what have you. Well, Paul was quite a character. We read in Acts 8.3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, women, committing them to prison. He was a nightmare for Christians. Well, we go on and continue to read. We read of both good things and bad things at this point. We have Simon the sorcerer, who is apparently converted but then when the apostles show up and start doing signs and wonders, he's like, how much is it? What do I have to pay to have the ability to do what you guys are doing? And then he gets rebuked by Peter. Your money perish with you. But then we have another really beautiful account of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. He's reading Isaiah, and he needs some instruction. I mean, imagine that, instruction on how to understand Isaiah. And Peter or Philip's explaining this to him, and he's baptized. And then when he comes out, you know, from his baptism, Philip has disappeared. You know, so you have these wondrous events taking place. And then in chapter 9, there's, I wrote in my notes, Saul finds himself encountering Christ on the road to Damascus. And I realized when I looked at that this morning, I should have put it the other way. Saul didn't encounter Christ. Christ encountered Saul. And he's on his way, you know, breathing murder and threats, you know, and then Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus. Why are you persecuting me? And I always think it's interesting the way Saul responds. Who, who are you, Lord? <laughs> now, and I realize Lord can be a more of a broad term, but I always found it kind of amusing. But what we have there at the conversion of Saul is that Paul now becomes the primary instrument in the hands of God for the remainder of Acts, even though in the very next chapter we see Peter has a vision 
And in an encounter with a Gentile named Cornelius, and Peter's like, no, I don't eat anything but Jewish food, and I don't do anything but Jewish traditions. And God kind of goes, look at my new covenant is international. It is, it is every nation, kindred, and tongue. It is not constrained any longer to Israel. And now all of a sudden we realize that this was always the promise, right? That all the nations of the earth will be blessed, not just one. I've always compared it to like 4th of July when we used to have fireworks back in the before days. And um, it would be night and you'd see one little stream of light go up. And that's the old covenant. That's Israel. But when Jesus is born and the new covenant begins, it explodes and then covers and lights the whole sky. That's the new covenant. That's what Peter had to learn was the international nature of the new covenant. Well, it continues, and again, we can't go into all the things, but both Peter and Paul continue to preach. They continue to advance the kingdom. They continue to get put in prison. They continue to get stoned and beat and all these things, and it is... Paul's three missionary journeys that we read of, where he's starting all these churches, and in due time, we're going to read the letters and study the letters that he wrote to those churches, right? And Romans and Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and so forth. We'll get to that, you know, in in future weeks. But we also see something that's worthy of our attention. You probably heard us, you know, we're Presbyterians, and so you've heard us talk about our session, which is the elders. You've heard us talk about maybe our presbytery, which is, you know, churches in Southern California, Arizona, Hawaii. It's like our, our group of churches. And then there's a thing called the General Assembly, which is all the churches in our denomination. That is not just something that, you know, the Presbyterian church created because it seemed expeditious. The, the model for that comes from chapter 15 of Acts called the Jerusalem Council. Because now that the church is international in nature, there's all sorts of problems. Because some people are saying, well, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved because they, they were kind of trying to import really a false idea of Judaism into the church. And so here we have the leaders of the church getting together and having a council. And basically, and this is a, a lesson I think for, for, you, for us as elders... And for you as members, because you're the ones who nominate and pick elders, that you want people like this. They are getting together. They know the word of God, but they're also sensitive to the immaturity of these new people who have now become part of the new covenant. So that's the discussion. Their discussion is, how do we deal with these new people in order for us not to lay a burden on them that we couldn't even bear ourselves? And it's a really a beautiful exchange of the leaders of the early church. We also read there of the wonderful conversions of Lydia and the Philippian jailer. It's just, the Philippian jailer has got to be one of the best, you know, when they, you know, they're all imprisoned, right? And there's this earthquake and it all, all the doors open and the jailer kind of looks around and he figures he's going, to be, he's going to kill himself because the punishment for letting your prisoners go away was death. So he's like, well, I'll just take care of myself here because... I'll do it quick, but they never actually left. They stayed. They're like, hey, Paul's like, don't do that. And, it, you know, he's like, well, what? He was, he was impressed. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? Believe, and you shall be saved and your household. We also see here the Apostle Paul engaging, and this is, you know, as an apologist, one of my favorite places, uh, Mars Hill. Mars Hill is this place where all the philosophers, all the sophists got together to hear some new thing, you know? And, and Paul showed up, in, you know, in Athens, and he's like grieved at all the idolatry, right? And he's like, you know, and he's trying to figure out, how am I going to reach these guys? And so what does he do? He's looking at all their idols, and he sees this one to an unknown God, and he gets an idea by the Holy Spirit. He goes, yeah, I perceive that you guys are very religious, I also see that you have a, you know, an idol to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that unknown God. He is God. He is the triune. And he goes on and explains to them that this unknown God is, in fact, God. Well, some are interested and some aren't in what the Apostle Paul has to say. But, he said, but we see something there that as a pastor... I have always viewed as very precious. And that was the Apostle Paul saying, I never hesitated to preach the full 
counsel of God. That's why I think it is valuable to go through the Bible. You know, we're going through 66 books, you know. But even if you're going through one book, to kind of go through that book, rather than uh, me kind of going, hey, I have a topic that I'm particularly interested in, and so for the remainder of my life, we're going to do uh, eschatology, because that's really interesting to me. Therefore, every time you come to church, we're going to talk about the end of the world. And Paul's like, no, no, no. We preach the full counsel of God. He also gives a warning, and it's a warning that we need to heed to this very day. We read uh, in Acts 20, 20 and 29, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Again, you might go, well, I'm not an overseer. I'm not an elder. But you're the ones who vote, nominate elders. So you take this to heart. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So the enemy of the church is not just without, it's within. And we must ever be vigilant. Well, as Acts comes to a close... The focus is upon Paul and his arrest and his trial. You know, he comes in face to face with governors and, and, and kings. And finally in this trial, he's like, I appeal to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen. And it, these, this is very interesting stuff. If you ever get there and read it, I mean, he's, um, he's on trial. He, he gets slapped and he insults somebody. I mean, it's just almost movie-worthy material. But at some point... He decides to appeal to Caesar. But what you also see in these trials is that the Apostle Paul, during these trials, is constantly giving the entire gospel message to the point where, like, one king just goes, are you trying to convert me? I mean, you want me to become a Christian too? You know, and I'm sure the Apostle Paul's answer to that would be, yes, I do. There's always this opportunity to minister. All right, but let's now... We're about done here, so I want to finish answering the question that I gave you in the beginning, and that is, what does it mean, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How, what do we do with that? Um, is it a unique event in terms of the accomplished work of redemption, or is it something that should continue to be expected in the church to this day, and if it's not, why isn't it happening? Why is it we don't have the rushing winds and the tongues of fire? Well, in John 14, Jesus says something that there's a little passage here that I think a lot of people misunderstand. This is what he says. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, okay, so that's the event, right? Sending of the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, a lot of people look at that and go, okay, this is the Holy Spirit reminding me of everything I learned in the Bible. Well, I think certainly the Holy Spirit works that way, but that's not what this passage says. This passage says the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all the things that I taught you when? When I was with you. Now, I'm looking around the room, I don't see anybody over 100, and certainly nobody's over 2,000 years old, which means that you, none of you have been with Jesus in the flesh. This applied to the apostles, that Jesus would ascend, he would send his spirit, and as the early church began, his spirit would reveal to his apostles infallibly, inerrantly, perfectly, the things that he taught them when they were together so that deposited in the early church would be the true word of God. And then God had that committed to writing and you have it on your laps. That is what happened. The word of God established. The helper will come. I will baptize you with the spirit and when I baptize you with the spirit, you will have the perfect, infallible, true message regarding the kingdom of God. 
What we read of in Acts, and I titled the sermon this, is the baptizing of the church. Today we baptized a baby. That's not spirit baptism. It is the Lord baptizing his church. Let me see if I can explain. You've got this this institution, this this organism, this body called the church. And they've gathered together. And he's going to pour his spirit out. He's going to baptize that gathering together. Now it starts in the upper room where he breathes on them and they receive the spirit. And then we see the full force of it at Pentecost where that event I was talking about a minute ago where the spirit comes and, and there's the tongues of fire and there's a wind, but there's also this ability to supernaturally speak not only a foreign language, but the word of God because the tongue once translated is actually the revelation, the word of God. So we've got this event taking place. That goes all the way up to chapter 19. So you're reading through Acts, because it wasn't just the upper room, and it wasn't just Pentecost, but 17 chapters later, they run into the disciples of John, and they're like, have you been baptized? Paul goes, have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul lays hands on them, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. You see, this, this baptized entity goes all the way back to Jerusalem. It's not as if God started this church all over the place. It started at one place and grew from there. That's why every time you see some type of supernatural event taking place in Acts, there's always an apostle there. There's always somebody who had been with Jesus. The church started at one place and grew from there. Like a, like a stone that becomes a mountain or like a seed that covers like leaven that permeates, but it starts in one place, and that is the baptized church. Well, you might be going, well, because I understand. I mean, the fact that this is a little confusing is why there's controversy. So let me see if I can clarify. And then if you want to ask questions during Q&A, email them in. But we are to understand, let me put it this way, we are to understand, as we are part of the body of Christ, that we are part of a baptized body. That when, that when we came to faith and became part of Christ's church, we became part of a baptized organism. Paul actually uses that argument when he argues for unity. He's trying to argue for unity in the church, and here's what he writes. And by the way, this is right in the middle of these controversial sign gift passages in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, really 12 and 14. He writes, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Even that's not easy, right? But let's go on. I think it becomes clear. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we've been all made to drink into one spirit, for in fact the body is not one member but many. And then he begins his body illustration, where he goes, you know, the hand can't say to the eye, I have no need for you. Paul is arguing for the unity of the body of Christ by talking about how we are all baptized into one body. Now, let me tell you, if you believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a subsequent event that happens after conversion, that some members of the church have it and some don't, you tear Paul's argument apart. That Paul's argument has no room for the haves and the have-nots. It has no room for those who are part of the baptized body and others who are not part of the baptized body. Paul's argument, the glue for his argument, is that we have all been baptized into one body, which is Christ, his body. Well, let me see if I can make this a little clearer. Think of, um, think, of, think of the body of Christ as a pool, all right? Remember earlier I was talking about all the way in chapter 2, you have the church gathered and people are looking at the church and God is establishing favor in their eyes, and he's adding. Remember we talked about that? 
Okay, so let's just kind of, I'm going to try to make this as clear as I can. So you've got this pool, right? And in the pool, you have the believers. That's, that's the church. And then you've got a bunch of people around the pool looking in. Right? Those are the unconverted. And then, and then by the grace of God, those people standing around look at that and go, I want the refreshment of that pool. And they jump in the pool. And the moment they jump in the pool, they become part of that baptized body. They don't, they don't splash water on themselves. They don't tarry in some other place. What they do is they become part of that baptized body, which is Christ. Now, you might go, well, how do I know? How do I know if this has, in fact, happened to me? Or better yet, how do I know this? And this is the important question, I think. How do I know that the, the pool I'm about to jump into is actually a real pool? When I was in high school, before I was a Christian, so I'm not advising anybody to do this, I went to Redondo High, and uh, they had an indoor pool back in those days, and the pool was, the, the building was shaped like this. It was like, you literally, literally could climb all the way up. I'm like, why in the world would you build a building like that? You're only tempting me to climb up it. And so me and a group of buddies, you know, in the middle of the night, climbed up to the very top, and there's a way you could get into, like, the attic. And then, you're, then you put, go over the side of the attic, and you can actually jump in to the pool. It was like 30 feet. And we're like, all right, let's jump in. And it's just dawned on me for a second, like, I don't see any current down there. You know, it's the middle of the night, it's dark, and there's, it's not like there's no water splashing. So I'm thinking, what if they empty the pool? Because this whole evening would not be quite as fun if that is the way it happened. And so the question you have to ask is, how do I know if I'm actually jumping in water or if I'm jumping in cement? And I would say first and foremost, because this is the biggest thing about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that it is the Word of God is there. The very first question we ask people who want to be members is, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God? If that, if that, bill, if that organism, if that entity, if that institution says no to that, I'll tell you right off the bat, that is, not, that is an empty pool. And beyond that, though, beyond that, though, you look at that Word of God, because as we said, it could be perverted. And this is something you see over and over and over in the teaching of Acts, and that is this. I mean, you can't go more than a chapter or two without the mentioning of the resurrection. That Jesus was raised from the dead by God and justifying us before a holy God. If the church doesn't believe in the word of God, if the church doesn't believe in the resurrected Christ, then it is an empty pool and we'll end with this word from, from Peter that we see in chapter 10 because we have seen at some level the church start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. It's still going forth. The Bible, Bible says that it'll, it'll, it'll cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. But we'll end with these words. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And I pray that's all of us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you've established your church. We do pray that we would have the wisdom to know the marks of a true church and what it means to be part of the body of Christ. We do thank you that you baptized your church with truth, that you, that you brought into this community that which is necessary to be known. Help us, Father, to be good students. Help us to understand what has happened for us. And help us, Father, to recognize your call in our lives, we pray through Jesus. Amen. i
seated and prepare your um, communion packets as we um, are about to engage in the Lord's Supper. And, you know, talking about Jesus leaving, you know, and it was good, one of the things that he instituted when he knew that his earthly ministry was coming to an end was the Lord's Supper in such a way as to, as to reach us um, in a very deep and you might say mystical sense where we take and we eat and we drink and we, we feed upon him by faith. If you believe that Jesus died for you, that he rose again for you, if you, if you as it were, are, are, have found yourself in that pool of refreshment, this is, this is our Lord's way of continually assuring us, reminding us that we belong to him, that we are in fact his and that the riches of heaven belong to us. So if you believe, well, even as Peter preached, the very first thing you ought to do is be baptized. And even as we said, you know, that, that, that God, is, God has determined that the church should be the organism, the institution by which these, these sacraments are administered. So if you believe in Jesus, if you've been baptized, if you're part of that body, that church, then it's the time for you to eat and drink and know. Know that it is well with your soul. And if you don't believe, I would just say, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Be baptized and become part of the body of Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would consecrate these elements from a common use to a sacred use. And we do pray that as we take and eat and drink, that you would invade our hearts with the truth, the comforting truth, that the ransom has been paid, and that we belong to you. We've been rescued. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, wrote this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. 
and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink. Our, our new post communion sound. <laughs> For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you prepared a body for your son to do your will and to accomplish all that was necessary for our redemption. And we thank you that by your spirit and by your word, you've applied that message to our eyes, our ears, and our hearts and you've made us your own. And we thank you in the precious name and by the blood of Christ. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn. Now may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We're starting, so uh, if everybody can have it, either have a seat or uh, love and fellowship one another outside. And if you have questions, remember, um, you can either write them down or um, uh, email them from our webpage, ranchofhope.org. Try not to break stuff back there. Now we're yeah we're to write them yeah because the um, people a lot of people are watching and when there it's just dead air and some people are like I'm not I guess we're done you know so uh, but if you have a phone you can email it all right are we on are we are we live am I on I'm on yes am on? yes I'm on all right so we're beginning our time of question and answer and if you're just Tuning into this part, go to branchofhope.org and you can um, put your question there. Or if you're in the room, you can write it out. Um, we're not taking live questions here because um, people, a lot of people who are tuning in, when we have, sometimes questions could be fairly long and it just is a lot of dead air time. And so maybe you could just, if you could just take the time to write it out, that would make this more efficient. Okay, um, so do we have some questions here? We, we My, do. This is our able uh, deacon, Aaron Davies. Thank and you. so uh, fire away. All right. First question's from Arnie Stanton. Hi, Pastor Paul. <laughs> if I understand correctly, you believe Mosaic ceremonial laws were fulfilled once Christ rose from the dead. Thus, we do not need to follow those particular laws. In the New Covenant, are there any new ceremonial laws Christians have been required to follow, or are the laws we are to keep only moral laws? Yeah, it's a really good question. Okay, so in the Old Covenant, you have this elaborate system of ceremonial laws. Now, just so people know what we're talking about here, that you've got basically three kinds of laws. You've got a um, civil law, which we call, say, a crime. Then you have a moral law, which is really should be the basis for all civil laws. It's just the Ten Commandments. Don't lie, steal, cheat, commit a, a, idolatry, or what have you. But then you have ceremonial laws. And, you know, when we see a verse in the Old Testament, like, I desire obedience over sacrifice, 
you're kind of going, well, isn't sacrifice a, a law? And he, you're, you, if you look at that, you're like, when I, God's going, I desire that you obey my moral law rather than do worthless sacrifices. You really stood to the sacrifices, but they mean nothing if you're not doing them with a faithful heart. So you've got three kinds of laws. You've got civil, ceremonial, and just moral law. In the Old Testament, the ceremonial was very extravagant. You had a whole priestly system, you had a temple, you had sacrifices, you had washings, various animals, you know, that were put to death and so forth. Now, it is generally agreed by almost everybody I have ever read that the ceremonial laws ended with the new covenant with Christ because they all pointed to Christ, you know, essentially. The temple, everything, is all pointed to Christ. But that doesn't mean there aren't what we might call ceremonial laws in the New Covenant. We have two, the Lord's Supper and baptism. And we, we, probably, we don't generally call them that. We call them either ordinances or sacraments. But those two, as simple as they are, point back to everything that the Old Covenant pointed forward to and more, kind of like because it's a fuller, richer, more inclusive covenant. So, yeah. Next question is also from Arnie Stanton. When did believers become temples of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Right. When did they first become yeah. temples uh, of the Holy Spirit? I would say, yeah, you've got this imagery, you know, that you see in the New Testament. And that, similar to what we were talking about a minute ago, you've got these foreshadows in the Old Testament which included a temple, right, being built by stones, you know, and what have you. So in the New Testament, when that's beginning and the church is beginning, you have, metaphorically speaking, because obviously we don't actually become a physical temple, um, you see Jesus and John, in the very beginning of John, say, tear this temple down and I will build it in three days. But he's speaking not of the temple, but he's speaking of his body. And then we see also not only is the body of Christ resurrected in three days, um, but the body of Christ, i.e. the church now, the New Covenant Church begins, and he's the head and we're the body, so we're coupled with him as one organism. And that's where you see Paul and Peter kind of using the imagery, and the imagery is, kind of, is quite beautiful, right? Because he's talking about how you know, in regard to morality, you know, Paul's talking about the idea of us being temples of the Holy Spirit, but Peter talks about us being living, being living stones built into a holy temple. So the picture you almost get there is that each stone is its own temple being built into an ultimate temple. And those, those, that imagery, as far as I know, is only found in the New Testament, even though it's anticipated, I think, in the Old Next question is from Kobe Krikak. Hello, Pastor Paul. A few weeks ago, you said that everyone in the New Covenant is not necessarily regenerate or saved, just as everyone in the Old Covenant is not necessarily regenerate or saved. How then do you address those scriptures which suggest that everyone in the New Covenant is, in fact, regenerate and saved? What about Jeremiah, who defines New Covenant members as those who have, quote, the law written on their hearts? And as those who, quote, all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And as those whose, quote, iniquity is forgiven. And as those who have, quote, the fear of God in their hearts that they do not turn from me. And finally, Ezekiel, who defines them as those whose hearts of stone are replaced with hearts of flesh with new spirits within them. And whose sins are cleansed with new hearts, with God's spirit causing them to walk in his statutes and rules, right. among other passages. Could these descriptors be true of both believers and unbelievers in the New Covenant, or do these descriptors apply only to believers and therefore set a new prerequisite for inclusion into the New Covenant community? Right. No, it's a good question. And, um, you know, this is where, you know, uh, we as Reformed Presbyterians might lock horns with, like, Reformed Baptists. And, um, but the, the, the short answer to the question is that you will often hear in corporate designations, for example, that Israel in the Old Testament was the apple of God's eye. You are the apple of my eye, right? 
So, you know, you could, if, he was, if he was gonna add to his list of, you know, how could you say that people who are the apple of God's eye are actually unregenerate? Well, you're like, well, that's kind of tough. You now we gotta figure out a way to, to get around that. The fact that there is a corporate designation does not always mean that everybody within that corporate designation has all of the attributes that are highlighted. For example, in the New Testament, you know, the Apostle Paul will address a letter to a church as to the saints at. Okay, so, okay, that church is full of saints. But then later, he'll call out certain individuals within that church who aren't saints at all. So you've got this general designation in terms of the outward observable administration of the covenant, right? The church, what we call the visible church. But then you have, and so I don't have a problem, for example, getting up in the pulpit here, looking at our church and saying, Jesus loves you and Jesus died for you to our church. But what you often hear us say is something along the lines of, you know, kind of the subjunctive clause, right? If you. Because even within the body, the fact that you're part of this body that's being designated as the object of God's loving, redemptive affection, it is very possible that there are individuals within that body who may not be. The Lord, Lord people, did we not people? And those people are in the New Covenant Church can almost be indistinguishable from the others. It wasn't like the apostles knew that it was Judas, right? It wasn't like when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray us, that they said, it's going to be Judas, huh? I knew I just got... No, they were like, is it me, is it me, is it me? So those, the way you have to understand this is, I would argue that it's entirely unworkable to say that in the New Covenant, the church is only going to be um, populated by people who are genuinely, genuinely regenerate because we don't have access to people's hearts. So you have a, what you call a credible profession of faith. Nonetheless, all those designations are designations that would refer, that you, could, you can address the visible body with, but that doesn't necessarily mean it applies to every last single person in that body. And that's an important hermeneutical principle, by the way, I think. Good question. Next question is from Mark Howard. In progressive dispensationalism, Pentecost is thought of in these terms, quote, at Pentecost, the disciples witnessed the birth of the New Testament church and the coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell all believers, end quote. Is the dispensational idea that at Pentecost, the church had its inception, meaning that the redeemed community of the Old Testament were not considered the church? Secondly, is there a thought that at Pentecost, this is when believers in redemptive history were indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I would say, and I, I labored in my sermon to say this is the beginning of the New Covenant Church or the New Testament Church or what have you, because the church did not begin at Pentecost. Um, God's assembly of his people goes all the way back. So there is an old covenant church. Now, Israel, which, which was both a church and a nation, but you have, in Israel, you have priests, you have sacrifices, you have believers, you have excommunication, you have all the things that make a church a church in the Old Covenant. And so I would not say that the Old Covenant is not a church. I would say that the, uh, at Pentecost, we, begin to, we see the beginning of the New Covenant church. I would also say that the uniqueness of, the, of Pentecost and the uniqueness of the pouring out of the Spirit at Pentecost was not so much soteriological. It wasn't so much, the Holy Spirit works in salvation, right? The Holy Spirit takes our heart of stone, turns it into a heart of flesh. I would argue every person ever saved from Adam on to the last person who becomes a Christian at the end of history are all saved by the work of the Holy Spirit, changing their heart of stone to a heart of flesh. No, nobody's ever going to be saved by somehow figuring it out themselves. Everybody needs the work of the Spirit. I think the uniqueness of the pouring out of the Spirit in the New Covenant at Pentecost was the granting of the full expression of the redemptive work of Christ, his life, death, resurrection, ascension, 
And, you know, glorification. That's why the Holy Spirit wasn't going to be poured out until he was glorified. And so I would not say that the unique pouring out of the Spirit in, um, at Pentecost was necessarily regenerative. I don't think all the apostles got saved at Pentecost. I think they were already saved. But they did receive um, a renewed understanding of what Jesus had taught them, which now they conveyed and the church started. Walter Beckman asks, I did not understand your explanation of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26 as applying to the helping the apostles remember Jesus' words so they could write the New Testament. Since Paul, Luke, and Mark weren't present in the upper room, this idea doesn't seem to apply to them. But between them, they wrote most of the New Testament. Right. Yeah, so what you see, and it's a good question, although, you know, Paul had definitely had a personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, but even he referred to himself as one born out of time. And some people would argue that when he writes Christ Jesus, he's writing it because he kind of had the backward experience of a personal encounter. And, um, but here's something to, to understand. It's a good question. And again, I didn't have the time. I, when I was in China, I spent four days, eight-hour days doing all of this. But let me just put it this way. Because the apostles, if you look at the apostles, you could include, say, Barnabas, right? Barnabas was preaching. Barnabas was doing signs and wonders. So you really have more people than the 12. But what, what you'll find is that whenever, whenever the signs and wonders are the pouring of the Holy Spirit came out, and I think it's B.B. Um, Warfield points this out, that every time that happens, there is an attendance, an apostle. These things aren't happening in an isolated incident. They're, so even though Paul and Mark and Luke weren't there, they were with the apostles, and they were giving apostolic, given apostolic authority. And so... We even see in there, you know, young men and young women prophesying and what have you. So it wasn't that, but it was all, all of it was overseen. That's why the Apostle Paul, who had that personal encounter with Jesus when he's addressing the church at Corinth, would say, you guys think you have a sign, you think you have a gift, you think you have a word, you need to know that what I say is the word of God. So the, the authority of the apostles always took precedent over the misuse that would inevitably take place in, in all of this. But the important thing for us to recognize is that with the pouring out of the Spirit happened initially with the apostles and then moved out from there. All right, next question. You mentioned the use of the Spirit, rushing wind and tongues of fire, ceased after the apostles who were with Jesus died. How did the church transition out of using them was it when the last apostle died they stopped? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, there's, there's, there's no indication, by the way, that the tongues of fire and the rushing wind was happening. Um, those things were happening in the early church, clearly in the early church, between the ascension and, you know, the end of the, the, end of the, uh, the canon, you know, the destruction of the temple. Clearly there are still sign gifts, uh, sp speaking in tongues at Corinth, speaking in tongues, word of knowledge, revelation, healing by the laying on of hands, by the hands of apostles. So that's clearly taking place. But I getting to the heart of that question, yes, I would say that with the death of the last apostle, which I would say also coincided with the closing of the canon, and the end of the old covenant and the destruction of the temple, we have all that now, all that was necessary for the church to actually fulfill the Great Commission. We don't need anything, we don't need any new information. All we need is the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the information we already have. We don't need new information. And so, yes, I would say that those, those particular sign gifts, now keep this in mind. Why do they call it a sign gift? These are not, this is a biblical designation. Why is it a sign? 
For example, speaking in tongues, if you look, and we don't have time to get into the details on this, but the Apostle Paul is explaining why tongues was a sign gift and what it was a sign of, and he appeals back to Isaiah 28, where it would be a sign of judgment. And so there was a sign that, the, that these people should have recognized that this supernatural ability somehow marked or gave the sign of a judgment that was coming upon Israel, which happened in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed, which Jesus taught about in detail. And so once, one, look at it this way, if it's a sign gift, once the thing that the sign points to is done, the sign is no longer of use because the thing that it was pointing to has already taken place. And that generally escapes our exegetical notice when we're going through these things. Good question, though. All right, Clark Roses asks, the socialists slash communists by design and stated plan have taken over academia, indoctrinated three generations of students, dominate the news media, the sports and entertainment industry, major corporations, and most branches of government, bureaucracy, federal, state, and local. <laughs> The church, both Christian and Jewish, have not escaped the plans of internal invasion. How do you detect and deal with the introduction of new philosophies and the planting of the seeds of dissension and division? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. You know, I didn't mention, I mean, I, my sermon went long as it was, but interestingly enough, people will appeal to acts for socialism. Have you guys, right? And, um, you know, because everybody was not viewing their possessions as their own and they were giving as need, you know from him who has to him who does not, and so forth. Um, but the people who try to promote that, or it escapes their attention that the government wasn't commanding them to do that. They were doing that out of the goodness of their own heart. They weren't doing that because they were being forced into some type of governmental taxation or sharing of goods. But it, to, to answer the question, uh, I think it's a really good question. How do we detect that? How do we know when the savage wolves have arrived, either in the form of bad theology, which inevitably bleeds into the politics and the culture and, you know, the whole zeitgeist of the community in which we live. I would say, here's what's, here is very, at least to me, interesting. There is a temptation in all of this political pandemonium to become, you talk about grinding an ax, to talk about every sermon, to talk about Masks, no masks, pandemic, you know, the election, uh, you know, and all that stuff. And I almost feel like the devil's kind of going, let's get them preaching about all that stuff rather than going through the word of God. And I would say that the real answer in terms of contending for the faith is to remain in the word and at places where it you know, it applies to whatever's happening, it, it applies. But don't let that take over. We need, to, we need to be people rightly dividing the word of God. Church needs to revolve around word and sacrament, word and sacrament, word and sacrament. And if we go away from that, then we're not going to be a house of redemption. And if we're not a house of redemption, we're certainly not going to be salt and light in our culture. So we need to stay in the word and I, I think you can argue that the condition that we're in right now is part and parcel because it's, the church departed from the word a long time ago in the culture in which we live. But what's, what's encouraging is that when you go to like China, you go to Asia, you see these new budding kind of sprouting Christians who love the fact that they have a Bible. And they're digging into it like a dog in a bone, like right to the marrow. And they're just, they are in it. And they're dog-eared. And we need, to, we need to have that. Next question is from Delia Davies. Hi, Aaron, and hi, Pastor Paul. <laughs> Coming from a Pentecostal and charismatic church background, speaking in tongues has been a topic of much conversation in my life. I've been in prayer circles where Christians are, quote, speaking in tongues during prayer these are godly Christian people who truly love the Lord and are fervent in prayer and Bible study. They often have a story or experience associated with the speaking in tongues where they would say they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
What are your thoughts on what is going on in the hearts and minds of these believers when they say they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and are now speaking in tongues? Does it give them any benefit? Maybe it makes them feel very spiritual and that spurs them on toward godliness? Is there any harm in their believing that they are speaking in tongues? Any advice for what to do should we find ourselves in a prayer group where someone starts speaking in tongues? Yeah. I mean, I've been in those prayer groups. First of all, I think, and I mentioned in the sermon, I just want to reiterate, that um, I don't view the charismatic or Pentecostal community as, um, as outside of Christianity. And I think that I would want them, and I know people will hear this sermon on the radio and, you know, and disagree with me, and I would hope that they would be charitable, and I want them to be charitable toward me, and we should be charitable toward them, and uh, you don't want to be mean-spirited, and you don't want to be unnecessarily exclusive or divisive. Having said that, clearly, you don't want to avoid the issue either. You don't want to go, well, because it's potentially divisive, let's just not talk about it at all. You have to talk about it, and, um, you know, you know, and I, I have arrived at a conclusion that I would argue for, and hopefully lovingly and biblically. But I had uh, Dr. Ken Gentry on my radio show years ago, and I asked him very much that similar question, like, hmm. so what is really going on? Because inevitably, there are times when I have taught this topic, and somebody will raise their hand, and they'll give me an anecdote of their personal experience, which seems to contradict what I just taught. And it's very difficult to doubt somebody's personal experience, right? If you had the experience, I can't say, no, you didn't have the experience, right? So what you want to maybe do is help them redefine what that experience might have been. Because what I've also found is, if you have a word of knowledge, if you have speaking in tongues, if you have, that's the word of God, right? If you have a prophecy, that's the word of God. Now, I have to tell you, I've known very few people in the charismatic community who I say, if I ask them, is your experience make what you're about to say equal with the scriptures? I don't think I've ever met one person who said yes to that. They, they're all kind of going, no, no. It's, it's, and I'm like, well, it's like the Holy Spirit light or something. You see, you got this other thing going, this lesser thing. And I'm going, okay, well, let's define that then. Because I don't doubt that you had something. Like even today, somebody came up to me after my sermon and gave an anecdote about somebody. And, uh, you know, Gentry was like, there, he had like, he had categorized. There are seven things it could be. It could be mass hysteria. It could be psychological disorder. It could be satanic. It could be this, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know when somebody has it. I don't know what it is. I, I don't feel it's incumbent upon me or I have a responsibility to go... Um, here's what happened. I feel like I, my argument is simply, here's what it's not. Now, it could be any number of things. I have to say, um, you, you know, it was a good question, because she's like, maybe, people, maybe it feels good. Yeah. And I, I, sometimes I'm typing, and I'm writing, and I get like writer's block, or I'm just, and I, I just hit the keyboard. You just hit it, like boom, boom, boom. And when I had, you know, in the old days, when you actually had a typewriter, You'd ruin paper, you know, and you'd have to take it. But now with, this, with computers, you could just do that and then delete it. But I have to say, it feels kind of good. Blah, 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 blah. You know, DJ Jeff, blah, blah. you got these letters. And they don't mean anything, but it felt good to do it. Mm. And I don't doubt that it might feel good to, to get out there and, and say this. But let me tell you something else. Glossalia, the, the tongues, it is, it's a, you see it in Acts, you see it in Corinthians. It, it, it's only defined in Acts. And it is defined as the ability to speak a foreign language. It is never what we might call incoherent babble. It's never that. And, and it's not like the Apostle Paul going, okay, we got a different type of tongues here. It's the same word. And so if somebody has it, it's the supernatural ability to speak a foreign language. Now, of course, today somebody said, they, have, they had heard somebody who had the supernatural ability to speak a foreign language, if I heard them right, or the person heard it, in, which is also interesting because it's the gift of tongues, not the gift of ears, right? So I don't know how, how that worked. But, but all that to say, um, well, let me, let me share one last story to answer that question because it's a really good question. And um, 
I was teaching this very class probably about 10, 15 years ago at our church. And um, it was Sunday night, and there was 200, 200 people here. It was pretty well attended. And there was a lady who was a member of our church then. She's since gone to glory. And she was like in her 80s then, and she was the sweetest, adorable woman. And she's like, after I taught it, she raised her hand. She was like, Pastor Paul. I'm like, yes, Kathy. She's like, during World War II, my husband was flying between England and Germany, uh, like missions. And he, he took off on one mission, and I really felt the Lord told me that he was not going to return. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. He died on that mission. Mm-hmm. So she goes, so are you telling me the Lord didn't actually tell me that? <laughs> and then it's like a, 200 people all look at me, and they're like, are you going to crush this woman? Like, for 60 years, this has been. And um, I, give, I go, you know, I don't, I don't doubt that somehow, that God providentially could convey to you information that would comfort you at this difficult time. I go, what I'm saying is, he's not speaking to you the way he spoke to Samuel. All right? The way he spoke to Peter. And I, I took a little risk there. And she's like, well, no, that's not what it was. It wasn't him speaking to me like that. It was more like an impression. And I'm like, I don't doubt God can do that at all. So it was kind of like helping her redefine what actually took place without, you don't want to do that. Because people get very heated about this because people who are very into the charismatic, that's their touch point with God. Like that's where they're connecting. But let me tell you something else. As you know, our church, we're an Orthodox Presbyterian church, but we started out as a four square church plant. So we got a big history of this. And for those of you who don't know, four square, Amy Semple McPherson, charismatic, you know, leader and all that. Um, I've also seen amazing, amazing amounts of abuse of people going, God told me to tell you. Sometimes really horrible. Like, People on their deathbed. God told me you're going to be healed. And I remember one time somebody was like, I want to write letters to my kids. And they're like, no, no, no. God told me you're going to be healed, and that would be an act of faithlessness. And the person died, and they didn't write the letters. I mean, stuff like that, and I'm mentioning that one because it was heart-wrenching. But there's, that happens. Because the moment you give some person that amount of power in terms of the Word of God in your life, it becomes a very dangerous, dangerous place to allow a mere person to be. Anyway, good question. Grant Spear asks, in Acts 1-6, the disciples asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What assumptions in the question were wrong, and what was rightly assumed in their question? Yeah, well, um, it's funny because one of the guys, I try to, when I study, I try to, I went, many of you know, I went to five different seminaries. I went to a charismatic one. I went to two reformed. I went to a dispensational one. And um, then I went to Fuller, which is depending on what room you're in. And, um, <laughs> and so I, I like, sometimes I like the dispensationalists. I feel like, you know, a guy like John MacArthur, I feel like he has a lot of good things to say, but I really disagree with him on certain things. And uh, there's a guy, Jay Sidlow Baxter, and he's not a, he's not a um, Schofield guy, but he's definitely a dispensational guy. And their, their, their argument, their position on, so, so you guys understand. So it's right, you know, this, it's right before the ascension, and they're like, okay, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And um, the dispensationalist will say that there was nothing wrong with that question at all, that the bona fide offer of the kingdom was given to Israel, and if they would have said yes to it, then that would have happened right then. And the promise of the old covenant promises to Israel would have been fulfilled immediately. So they would argue that nothing wrong with the question at all. The problem was Israel as a nation turned down the offer. I don't agree with that. I think that uh, there's a lot of other problems when you have that view, talking about chain, you know, dividing the church into Jews and Gentiles and what have you. I think their mistake was the nature of the advancement of the kingdom. I think there was this general idea that there was going to be, and by the way, my dispensationalist brothers, 
because they're not like the Charismatics. I don't, I don't agree with them, but I think they're brothers. They, I think, continue to make the same error, and that is they think the kingdom of God is going to come in a cataclysmic fashion, that when Jesus comes again, that's when he's going to take care of all the business, right? So it's not going to be like a mustard seed that starts small and gets big, or a, a rock that becomes a mountain and covers the whole earth. The, the, their metaphor has to be a mountain hits the image and immediately covers the earth. It doesn't, it's already covering the earth. And so um, I think that's their error that they're making when they ask that question. They, they're, and they had a lot of errors, right? I mean, they, they didn't, you know, they're like, you're not going to get crucified. I mean, it wasn't as if they didn't have confusion about what was supposed to happen. But I think their error was not recognizing that the advancement of the kingdom, which would be Jew and Gentile together, would be a long, slow process of the fulfilling of the Great Commission. I think that would be the error as I read it in that, in that verse. Yeah. Yeah, and then. Well, okay. So the 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 you know, and you gotta email it. So. But I'm gonna, no. <laughs> oh, is that in the email? There's no follow up here, Grant. Okay, no. right. No, no it's in the question. question. He's saying it's in the question. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what's right is this idea that there was a promise made to Israel, right? And so it's kind of like, when's God going to fulfill His promise to Israel? Okay, now we have to, like, jump forward, you know, to Romans 9, 10, and 11. We're not all Israel is Israel. And um, our Ephesians 1 and 2, where the Gentiles who were strangers to the covenant, strangers to the politics of Israel, the politeia, have now been brought in. And so, so truly we are, the church is the Israel of God. And so there is... They were right in that, but they needed still, as, as with Peter, to understand more fully that this new covenant church would be a combination of Jew and Gentile. So they're right in that, but it, it took a while. And if you read the New Testament, it's full of Paul trying to explain why they don't need to be circumcised. The, the Judaizers are just ever present. And... I don't, know, I'll be, I don't know how somebody can read Ephesians 1 and 2 and still walk away with the idea that there are different promises for Israel than there are for the church. I think they're, they're building the dividing wall that Paul teaches was torn down. That, that anyway, I'm going, I, I, anyways, that's, that's the answer, right? That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. Next question is from Aaron. Aaron. I think I know who that is. What are a few things you would disagree with Calvin on? <laughs> um, what are a few things? Well, sometimes I, um, I mean, I have to say, theologically, I'm hard-pressed to find very many things, like in his institutes. But in his commentaries, sometimes the way he approaches a verse, I might go, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know, and not just me, but other people. For example, um, I might not view, agree with Calvin on his view of the Sabbath. Calvin's view of the Sabbath is, was not reflected in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Cal, Calvin, I think, believed that the church should pick a day to be the Sabbath, but it wouldn't have to be Sunday. It could have been another day. Um, I, you know, and I... I think I, could, I think I could stand by that. I don't think I'm wrong in making that assertion. I also think that Calvin's view of the body of Christ and the unworthy participation at the Church of Corinth, I don't know if I agree with him on that. He, I think if I read that, I'm on the fence a little bit because what was going on was they were disregarding their brethren, right? I mean... People are not eating, people are not, you know, you're, you're ignoring your brothers and sisters in Christ, so you're ignoring the body of Christ in that respect, where Calvin's view was that it was actually 
the body of Christ, the physical body of Christ. And um, I mean, I'm, I don't have a firm conviction on that because I think both of them apply. But I, when I read that, I was like, I don't know if I agree with them on that. So, and there are other things. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> From Matt Messer starts with a quote from John Owen. To say that God does not or may not send his angels unto any of his saints to communicate his mind unto them as to some particulars of their own duty seems, in my judgment, unwarrantably to limit the Holy One of Israel, howbeit such things in particular are to be duly weighed with sobriety and reverence. What are your thoughts on God revealing his will through supernatural means today? Is it completely contrary to the Word of God, or is it possible simply not to be expected as normative? Yeah, I didn't really understand the first part, which was more of a statement, I guess, right? Then there was the quote from John Owen, and then the question was, what are your thoughts on God revealing uh, His will through? Okay, so let me give you a, my, my answer to the question. Um, I do believe that God does work providentially. I do believe that um, if we have eyes to see, we'll see the hand of God at work in the providential activities of our life. But I do think that the way, and I do believe that the Holy Spirit is at work, in terms of our better understanding of the scripture, our wisdom in terms of the way we interact in this world and how the two come together. Um, so I, I, you know, when somebody asked me, I was on a walk with a buddy of mine who is a continuationist, you know, and he's like, you're a cessationist. And he said, well, what do you think has actually ceased? And uh, the short answer to the, that is, I think that the verbal, plenary, infallible, inerrant word of God, has the conveyance of that has ceased. And so, um, which, by the way, he agreed with. And I'm like, well, then you're kind of partial cessationist, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I do think the other things, especially certain gifts that have not ceased, but people can begin to elevate them to a dangerous place. For example, I knew a woman years ago who was amazingly discerning, and I would say probably had the gift of discernment. Like she was the kind of person who could walk into a room and almost know immediately that this person had a bad day, this person had something wonderful just happen to them, and it was haunting how good she was at that. So, so people in the church began to like grant her almost like this supernatural prophetic ability to know things that I felt like was a bit much. Like, it's one thing for me to have the gift of discernment and be able to sensitively understand and read a room or read a person, and me, you know, as with Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he said. You know, I think you got to stop at that point. And so um, that's kind of where I, I draw the line on that. A.J. Hurley asks, Jesus said it's a benefit that I leave you so that the Spirit would come. Is this only referring to the Holy Spirit's New Testament gifting or is referring to indwelling? In other words, are Old Testament saints indwelled the same as New Testament saints? I would say, you know, I mean, I would, first of all, I said, like I said earlier, that I don't think anybody comes to faith but by the Holy Spirit, Old Testament, New Testament. Also, you know, David, David, um, prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So you do seem to see in the Old Testament, and I don't think, I, I also believe in the perseverance of the saints, old and new. I don't think David was praying uh, that he wouldn't lose his salvation. I think he was praying that God would restore the joy of his salvation, not his salvation. And so I do think that the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament, both in a regenerative sense and in a sense of gifts and encouragement and what have you, which we see in the new. But the other part of the question I think is really good too because initially I think what Jesus is talking about, seems to be clearly talking about, is Pentecost um, and the baptism of the Spirit upon the church. But with the, we also then have to make a distinction because it is not the position of, say, the cessationist that the Holy Spirit is no longer in any sense working in the church. So the position would be that the, Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible is the one who continues to open up the eyes of the people who read the Bible. But what he's not doing is 
building on that foundation any further. He's building, he's not, in, he's not increasing the foundation, he's building on the foundation. And when the Apostle Paul in Ephesians says the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, because we generally look at the foundation as Jesus, like, but he's the cornerstone. Paul says the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. Well, what did they do? Well, they gave us the message. And so we build upon that foundation, and that's not going to happen but by the Holy Spirit. Dan Merrick asks, Hi, Paul. Can you please explain how the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit? Because from all eternity, the Spirit has proceeded from the Father and the Son. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father through the Son? How does this mechanically work? <laughs> Well, it's funny because we were talking the last week about that, about, you know, um, you know, because you, you, you see interchangeably Jesus, not only with the Spirit, he's like, I'm going to send the Spirit, but my Father is going to send the Spirit. But you also see Jesus saying, the, you know, the Father will raise me, but I will raise myself. So we see it not only with the Spirit, we see it with the resurrection. And I've kind of like found it simple in a way to kind of look at that and go, okay, here, here are examples of the Father sending the Spirit and Jesus sending the Spirit. We never see it really the opposite direction. But I think there was some merit in the discussion we had last week that it's not merely a um, kind of um, something that happened in history, that it is the, the economics of the Trinity is that there's, you know, and that's the... Uh, the terms, and that we had a little bit of a different way we understood that. But in our circles, the, economic, the economical trinity is the relationship of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And that relationship is eternal. And so it is, even though they are all three God, they are equal in substance and so forth, there's definitely a distinction in their relationship with each other that didn't just happen at the incarnation. It's, it happened from eternity. It's, it's eternal. There's no... There's no point when that wasn't the case. Do you think I could ask you a question since I'm, I mean, there's one more here, but I could. I yes, ask, I there's, we have one more there. We do have one more question. And you get, yeah, you get the bonus question. I get the bonus question. Because okay. you've been. I did an email. <laughs> I'm reading the emails. So yeah, all right. I'll type it in here if I need to. Okay, Arnie Stanton asks, how theoretically would it affect believers if Christ, after his resurrection, did not ascend to the Father's right hand. Jesus, in my example, does leave his disciples, but does not ascend to the Father's right hand. Well, I mean, first of all, the, um, and I, you know, I, I think I had it in my notes, but I didn't say it, I don't think, but um, it's the ascension that is the fulfillment of the promise to David that I will, I will have on your throne my, my son. So it's, it is Jesus taking the throne as king of kings um, and ascended that he might fill his church, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So it is, it is Christ at the right hand of the Father who um, not only sends his spirit, but protects his church and um, governs all of reality. And so, I mean, I don't know that I'm going to argue here that there's like an actual throne that he's sitting on, right? Um, I mean, I guess there could be, but what I'm arguing here is that it is from that position that he rules and reigns above all things, principalities and rulers and authorities. It's from that position of having ascended that that takes place. So it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Okay, my question last was... Question. Last um, question. Last question, okay. Um, there, that's it, right? I mean, uh, one more just popped up. Okay. But, uh, yours, it's you, you, similar yours. to a past one. So, okay. okay. All right. um, you often hear in uh, concerts or maybe more charismatic churches, the calling upon the Holy Spirit, come be with us, come, you know. Is it appropriate in some sense to call upon God to come upon your gathering, particularly the Holy Spirit, yeah. to be with you now as... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the answer to that question is yes. I mean, we uh, we generally pray to the Father, right? And um, we have an invocation, right? Like, I mean, he there's a call to worship, or he's calling us. 
but we also kind of invoke his presence, you know, and we pray that he will inhabit the praises of his people and that Christ will be here and uh, tabernacling among us and what have you. I don't think it's inappropriate, even though when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father. Mm. But I don't think it's inappropriate to pray to Jesus or pray to the Spirit. And I don't think it's inappropriate to pray that whether it's the Father or the Son or the Spirit, to have a special presence um, always via the Spirit in the body of Christ. I think that's an appropriate prayer. I mean, we pray in our own study, you know, I'll pray that the Holy Spirit gives me the wisdom to understand a passage. I don't think that's inappropriate to do. I think it's probably a good idea. Okay, last question. Last question. Jerry O asks, how do you suggest to discuss tongues with our Pentecostal friends? Which I believe you kind of... Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you don't want to be, you know, sassy and make fun of them or pick or pick the worst examples of what goes on, you know, like barking in the spirit or, you know, there's all sorts of wild stuff, you know, and they're like, well, you know, that's, now you're building a straw man. Yeah. If you, and, and there's, that's out there. Like I said, even a minute ago when I said, you know, there are people who've done these prophecies that are so harmful, you know, some, might, some people might go, well, I've never done that. And I'm like, going, okay, I, I just want to give an example there of what might happen, I'm not saying you did this. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to speak charitably uh, uh, to them. And I think that if people in your discussions perceive that you're not really on the attack, but that you're really looking for clarification, and not only clarification, but you want your conversation to be of benefit, like redemptive. Um, you want it to be something that nurtures them and, um, and sanctifies them rather than attacks them, then you've created a relationship with somebody that can withstand brutal honesty, which is always nice to get to the brutal honesty. But if you start with brutal honesty, all they're going to hear is brutal. And so you got to kind of be careful the way, like I said, because especially with this topic, you're really beginning to attack what they view as like their touch point with God. And uh, you want to be delicate with that. Okay, we are finished. Um, Enjoy the remainder of your Lord's Day. And some of you are listening who are going to be here tonight at 5 o'clock. Look forward to our service. And uh, it's only for people, by the way, who are are genuinely highly at risk. So if you're hearing this and you're like, oh, I go to church at 5, we're really kind of trying to keep it very small for people who uh, aren't able to really get out of their house. So, uh, you know, we'd love to have you, but tonight is kind of particular. Hopefully, hopefully that's clear. I don't know, maybe it's not. All right, God bless and have a great Lord's Day.